Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Turn Two in 2015. But of course, total episode 41. And I I don't know who one of our guests are because they've they've changed their face. But <laughs> I am Chobra, so I can do my introduction. Uh, I of course the new host for Turn Two for a little while now, so I guess not new anymore. But uh, Turn Two. A show where we break down everything Hearthstone, whether it's community news, meta, even esports. And today we have two awesome guests, Nimsh coming over from Tabletop, which we just had if you're a live viewer. And of course, Farmir, who we had a little while earlier, win uh, the fourth week of Deck Wars. So welcome to both of you guys. And if you guys just want to do quick just introductions and hello to our viewers, that'd be great. Uh, Nimsh, why don't you start? All right, so hi guys. Um, I'm Nimsh, and I just played Tabletop. If you watched it, if you haven't, I'm the captain of Cloud9, and I'm into Hearthstone. Like, I'm a player, a caster, entertainer, streamer, and I'm really into the community stuff. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I was co-hosting uh, Turn 2 before, so it's, uh, it's a new thing to be oh, yeah, as a true, guest. Yeah. <laughs> I was a guest before as well, so, you know, it's like coming back kind of, right? It's like, you know, you do the, all the work, and now I, I will just sit and relax. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Faramir, um, on a quick intro and a hello to our viewers here for turn two. Hey guys, uh, I'm Faramir. I'm playing uh, Hearthstone for uh, Team I Had You. And yeah, playing Deck Wars earlier, I uh, did quite well. Uh, other than that, you can see me in a lot of other tournaments if you want to. I'm going to stream soon, so a lot of good stuff coming. So yeah. Sounds awesome. Yeah, of course, um, <clears throat> you guys can see all our social media here on screen right below our camera. So the viewers, if he, uh, you weren't aware of who each of us were, well, now you know, and you should definitely check all of our stuff out. But uh, today we do have some you know, fun things to talk about as we kick off 2015. And originally, you know, I think I'm still going to go with my original show notes. Uh, in the past, we would go with kind of esports first and then and go back and forth uh, into the meta. But today, since we were just talking about some decks and cards on Tabletop with Nimsh, I'd like to continue kind of that talk. And, you know, Farmer, you'll be jumping right in here. But we'll, we'll start with broader questions. Is that, you know, in, in the current meta now with GVG, uh, I, I think a lot of people were expecting just the game being flipped on its head. Like, we just see new decks everywhere. Um, it's all about, like, new cards. But what we're finding is the stability still obviously relies on a lot of the older cards just being utilized with slight newer changes. So, you know, what's really considered unique anymore? I mean, right now, I've, I bring this up because recently, I believe this time it was on, on Reddit where, you know, someone was like, well, you know, I reached Legendary with a unique uh, deck, like a unique Hunter deck. And everyone was like, I only see like two different cards. Is that is that really unique? Uh, but then some people were like, I guess so, because it plays a little bit differently. What do you guys think about that? That's revolutionary. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I'll pass but, the <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, let's be a little bit real here, right? It's that obviously number wise, it's a very small change. But should we consider that unique as a, as a community, given how card games work? I think well, so. I think like, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just fine. You can go. Oh, OK. Well, I think it's kind of got a little bit more mid range than what it used to be. Like we had it before the GVG, we had a bunch of control decks and a bunch of aggro decks, and now we have a lot of more mid range. We have a like Paladin. I think the biggest biggest uh, class that had like pro profited the most from the changes, and yeah, that's been the dominating deck so far. Still, we see like hunters coming, making a comeback after they dropped off in tournaments for a while. So yeah, a good uh, lot of old stuff coming back. Same classes that are strong, but like priest fell off pretty hard and shaman too. So oh. we're seeing a bunch of like old classes that were bad coming back to form, and yeah, good like, stuff that was good kind of falling uh, out of favor. So there are definitely changes in the in the meta game. Well, I I, I want to follow up that. Um... <laughs> What do you ask that you, you change a couple of cards and it changes the deck? It depends. I mean, if you change two cards and the structure of the deck becomes the same, uh, it, it remains the same, and you play the deck in the same way, then it doesn't change the deck really. And it's it's hard to say that some. Well, sometimes uh, we call people revolutionary when they um, add one card and they bring like a, a car, card that's not used to the meta game, 
And um, that's cool. Like, for example, Xiao at some point, um, he brought Hogger to Warrior and he was successful with right. it. And everybody was like, wow, Hogger was unused and, and somehow Xiao is now, now playing it and, it, and he, he is successful. So you can recognize that this is the Xiao's build. At some point, KitKats was um, remaking Warriors as well. Like, I, know, I don't know why Warrior... I think like Warrior changes were the, the most significant. Like adding mm -hmm. Corcoran Elite, for example, uh, changes the dynamic of the deck a bit. Then he added like Azur Drake. So uh, like changing a couple of cards can mean that the, the, the mechanics of the deck and how you play it change a bit because instead of just running um, a full control, you now have the tools to be able to be more aggressive. Um, a good example also is... Uh, running Leroy and Power of Overwhelming uh, Faceless Manipulator in your deck, uh, in your handlock, which means that now you have the burst and uh, you play the deck a bit different. Even though like the, the core mechanics are similar, uh, the deck is different. So uh, in Hearthstone, we have only 30 card decks. It's not like Magic or, or World of Warcraft card game where you have 60 card decks. So if you change five cards, it's actually a significant part of the deck. Change six, and it's it's a lot. And, uh, and the, the deck can change, and people are still fine-tuning the decks. They are searching for those new builds. And I feel you definitely have to respect that. And, and when somebody changes those six cards and brings a, a new archetype where people are like, yeah, this is just, uh, well, Paladin, we played Paladin before, you still have to respect that. Like even Reynat, when he um, changed Zoo a bit, like he changed, we, we mm -hmm. played Agro Warlock, but it was more bursty and, and Reynat added like Shield Bears. That's definitely where... Uh, he popularized the, the build, and, and this was something new. Even though we knew how to play aggressive Warlock because it was just no-brainer, he still changed and fine-tuned the list to have it a bit different and a bit more personal, and it worked. So definitely kudos. Cool. Yeah, I yeah. agree more with the... Like Jim said, if you change like five or, uh, four, four or five cards in the deck, you definitely change like the art of... Like the, the kind of the deck that it is, like change... Mm -hmm. The way you play it, and yeah, that's uh, that's like a significant percentage. We've changed like five percent, it's like one eighth of the deck. So, um, I definitely agree with them, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, that I would have to agree. Now, we'll we'll be jumping kind of back and forth, and I think this is how it will just turn out as Hearthstone develops more and more in both esports and as a community. But now, would you say? This is somewhat true because I'm actually in the tournament scene because I'm feeling that compared to the past. Uh, GVG has had much more of a, I think, immediate and bigger impact uh, for obvious reasons because it's 120 new cards uh, on the tournament scene. But then, for instance, I know for uh, like Dark Wanix is a little bit of an outlier because he's always been known for doing, you know, his own unique decks. But the fact that he made that you know Fell Cannon Warlock work and take him to the finals and then ended up winning the uh, that week at the Legendary Series, things like that, uh, it's not going to be as common on ladder, right? Because ladder, you always have to have the most consistent deck if you want to climb. And usually climbing is what people give the uh, credit to. It's like, if you got to climb up to legendary with a new deck, then it's kind of worth looking into. But if you're only hovering around like rank five, then maybe it's not stable enough. What do you guys think about that? Is it is it a lot more different? Do you think there's actually much more innovation now being done in the tournament scene uh, compared to perhaps on ladder? Well, I think you need to separate those two, like the like you you are talking about the props that people are getting, um, mm -hmm. that are climbing on ladder. You need to think about like ninety nine percent of people who play Hearthstone don't know that they, there's a tournament saying that we're playing tournaments for money for it, right? They're just playing the game casually and are having fun with it. So uh, climbing to to legend is a is a big deal, and like uh, doing well on ladder is uh, really really big because that's what they're doing all day when they're playing the game, and they're not worrying about like best of five best of seven scenarios. So yeah. a ladder is always going to be different from from tournament unless you're like running a ladder format. Um, like you saw in the ESL Legendary series what they're doing right now. They're running a format that's really, really close to ladder because it has like best of one games. Mm -hmm. And yeah, tournament is always going to be different. Um, the ladder, you always need the deck that's best for best of ones and that's normally like a aggro aggro deck or just like a deck that counters aggro because they win the most um like the, the deck that dark one x made is a really interesting interesting deck but um one of the reasons why it did so well is people didn't expect it and 
yeah, didn't know how to play against it. You can definitely work in ladder as well if you only play with like just the ones, but it's going to be less common because people are not that innovative that are playing a lot of ladder, I would say. Uh, you, you, most of the time you innovate decks to do well in tournaments, so that's where you're going to see a lot of deck innovations coming from players who are, are playing a bunch of tournaments. I think you can still innovate on ladder. Um, I'm watching, like, mm -hmm. I'm saying this from perspective of... Uh, of a teammate of Strifecore and Colenso, where those guys are just... Well, obviously, they want to um, innovate for tournaments, but uh, for ladder, you don't have to have the most consistent deck because like, you you have to f uh, figure out your aim. Like, Is your aim just getting to Legend, or is your aim getting first um, in Europe, or first in Asia, or first, first in A? Uh, because then you can have an element of surprise. Like, um, At some point, Colenso designed this um, really aggressive Warlock, uh, that was uh, somewhere like it was similar to the Dark Onyx Warlock, where uh, you have Arcane uh, Golem. It was even before GVG, like uh, the Arcane Golem, double power overwhelming, faceless, and it worked. I mean, I've seen many decks on Reddit where people just design a, a very uh, specific Shaman build, or they design a very mm -hmm. specific, um, well, not, not even in Mill Druid. Like they they have their own builds. <laughs> And they use them, and they get to legend. They get to the first place. So even though the decks are not consistent, they are consistent enough to to carry them. Where they make the, the good decisions, they know how to play the deck. And opponents are confused because if you are playing your deck that is consistent, let's say you are playing Zoo, because a lot of people play Zoo on ladder, you know the matchups. Like you you face Handlocks many times, you play Mirror many times, you play versus Hunter many times. You know how to play. But then you play versus this Paladin deck, and you have no idea what's happening. So what choices do you do? Like you, you for you, you choose to go for face because it's safe. And then uh, apparently this deck is running a lot of heal, and he just clears your board, heals up, and wins in the end with Deathwing or whatever. And then you lose. So it, like the element of surprise when you are playing your own deck um, is just uh, really invaluable. So I feel innovation is still. I think in Harson, especially after a set like GVG is being dropped. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I'm agreeing with kind of both sides of what you guys said, but I like that you brought up, you know, Mildred. Mildred are getting a lot of attention again uh, after GVG. Obviously, there have been some cards that have been added that lend itself more um, to that, I guess, archetype being a little bit more viable. Now, the thing that's come up in discussion uh, myself with some other people and also in the community is that Mill Druid, because it feels newer and a lot more different, there's that appeal to it to pay attention to it and watch it. But then obviously it's just it's longer games in general. And once you've seen it once, is it really worth to like keep looking at it? I mean, what do you guys think is the benefit of you know that co coming through? Do you think that uh, Mill Druid getting that attention was definitely beneficial for just the... I guess, uh, development of Hearthstone? Well, I think that the deck is definitely very interesting, uh, mostly because the, the main mechanics of Hearthstone is minion trading. So whatever deck you play, you will trade minions. It's like, even with Handlock, you try to get those giants and you try to get Jaraxxus, but you trade minions, trade minions. With the aggro midrange decks, you also trade minions, where, uh, where the mill deck is actually burning cards. So you're interacting more with your opponent's hand which is kind of like a mm -hmm. different approach. So uh, I'm sure it feels really refreshing. I haven't tried it myself, but uh, I know a lot of people are are trying and uh, and playing the deck and toying around it. So it's probably amazing versus control where uh, well, with 30 cards, Hearthstone games are really mapped. Like, you know that the guy is running double execute, double shield slam, or like Mage is running Alex Straza and he, will, he, he needs Alex Straza, he needs Iceblock to win versus you. So if you're able to interact with the deck and um, and burn cards, you can disrupt their strategy. And disrupting strategy is one of the key mechanics and strategies in, in card games, where if you disrupt the strategy of your opponent, you can actually win just by doing that. Well, um, Okay, you, why don't you go first, Farmer, because I have something to add on separately. Yeah, um, I haven't played it myself either. Um, I think decks like those um, are a lot of fun to play, and that's why people are drawn to them. Um, like I'm not, I'm not playing that much for fun, right? I'm, I'm trying to find the most competitive deck and play with it. So you don't have fun like, at all. Whatever. No, I don't have fun at all. <laughs> no fun allowed. No. I'm trying to get different classes to golden, please. So it's like my name is Fire and I play Hearthstone professionally. That's no fun at all. No, I have a lot of fun, but um, yeah, 
the Druid isn't my favorite class, I, I have to admit, but uh, I, I play a lot of Shaman, so I try to innovate that, right? Um, yeah, uh, the mill decks are definitely a lot of fun. Um, I think there's still not enough um, cards in in the game mm -hmm. to to play that strategy and be consistent with it. Like it's it's a it's a part of strategies in other card games because they already have a lot of more a lot more cards to uh, like to to sustain that strategy. Uh, you could say and. In Hearthstone, it's most of the time you let your opponent draw cards. They drop like three cards a turn, and then you give them three cards again, and then you just set card advantage, and that's like how, how you lose in that that matchup, right? Most of the time, so they just they just drop their hand, and then you're sad because you have to give them like three cards again because that's their strategy. And that if if Hearthstone like ends getting uh, a lot more cards that are um, solid in minion trading plus um, plus burning cards. Because that's what you would need, then um, then it could definitely get a vi uh, become a viable strategy. Like dancing swords, for instance, that's like one of the cards that could that that could be really good in a future mill deck because it's like good stats and uh, and it's drawing your opponent a card, which is con now considered a downside to a card. That that's why the stats are so good. But mm. if if it's uh, gonna end up being an upside, then you're really really glad about that particular minion. So. Um, not so while, yet. while we're talking about this and uh, you guys both touched upon different aspects of what i'm about to ask is that dealing so you nymphs you put it in a way where you said well it's different because now you're dealing more with the opponent's hand and their deck rather than what's on board and the minions and farmer you're saying well i actually think we don't have the you know cards that deal best with this type of strategy you know it's just kind of one part of it in each card right it's either you draw or it's a good trade minion but as you know, if you've played other games in various genres, it, a term that you'll often see is anti-fun, right? Anti-fun or griefing. And, you know, where do you find that line? And obviously this is very personal opinion, uh, even game designers. That's why some uh, different game companies take different stances on what's considered griefing or anti-fun. But at one point, does it turn into, like, I'm just taking control of your hand and therefore it's not, like fun or fair. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we we saw that um, earlier in Hearthstone, right? Um, we saw we saw those mechanics. Uh, like people are, are were complaining that the game is like getting less interactive because of cards like Net Pagel. Like if you think about the old Net Pagel was a zero four for two mana that draws a card fifty percent at the end of turn, so you could win the win the game with card advantage just uh, because of um, Random outcomes, just like because of a flip of a coin that you won. Um, another one was uh, the the Leroy combo for Mirko Rogue. You had uh, what was it, six, twelve, eighteen damage from your hand without your opponent that that could do anything about it. Like if you play a taunt, get sapped, and then it costs eight mana to deal eighteen, uh, ten mana to uh, deal eighteen damage. But it could they still could do it. So Blizzard tried to remove those from the game, right? Those. Um, those combos that and, and cards that are just like pe some people are calling it solitaire, right? You, you're not interacting with your opponent; you're just like playing your game plan and ignoring what he does, basically. And they're encouraging the the interactive play. And I think that's that's the way to go. Um, that's like that's why maybe the mill mill strategy isn't that this not the future, but I I could definitely see that. Implemented and there, there are ways around uh, to play around mill decks, right? There's not like a card yet that lets your opponent draw ten cards and it's like discard five of them. <laughs> so, and there's not that broken card yet that automatically wins you the game for a mill deck. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, if that card ever comes out, people are gonna riot in on Reddit or in Twitch chat <laughs> or whatever, and Blizzard gonna notice and yeah, see that they. Made a card that made the game less fun, and uh, yeah, I think they're on top of that, and they got some good people that are paying attention. So I hope that's not going to happen. Yeah, I think like basically Hearthstone needs uh, other mechanics as well. Like uh, mm. I, I like burn burn mechanic to burn cards. Uh, as like like as Farmir said, as long as you can interact with it and you can by playing cards, but maybe you can have cards that 
limit uh, the number of cards in your hand. Like uh, something like this, uh, you steal the secrets with the Cousin Mystic, right? So maybe you have mm -hmm. like, if, if the mill deck becomes the thing, then Blizzard releases an anti-mill card in the, in the next expansion or adventure mode where maybe you play a card and uh, you can't burn cards. Like you play this dude and then you are not able to, to burn the card if you overdraw. Uh, which will be fun, and um, like, but you know, basically, I I like seeing different mechanics than just trading minions and going for face. So I like how freeze mage is uh, just stalling and then trying to kill you with Alexstrasza and uh, and burn and burst, and uh, then warrior is also trying to stall, control the board, and trying to win with the with the big finishers. Um, I'm used to Magic and Warcraft where people were using very different strategies. Like you were talking with the graveyard, which which is our cards you, you, you use. So you just uh, discard cards from your hand and then try to bring them back bring their ba uh, them back. Or you also like discard your op opponent's hand. I know that Blizzard is not really happy with discarding cards or like making the game unfun, but I feel like having different mechanics is cool. Like even something, uh, well, this is uh, relating to Yu-Gi-Oh, something like Exodia where you try to, like, your deck is built around trying to get specific setup, like a set of cards, mm -hmm. and then when you play them, you win, or you put yourself in a position where you, you actually win, instead of, so, like, more like a combo decks, right, where it's not about just playing Alexstrasza and, and trying to use the big cards to kill them, but maybe just figure, something like this, we have this this gnome, how is it called, the head, uh, Mimiron's head, it's mm -hmm. similar to the combo deck. Like I, I'm re really looking forward to a deck uh, based on Mirren's Head, where you are uh, trying to get those mechs and try to have um, the, this Mimirian mech and be able to win with it. So more like combo decks. I really like combo decks. Yeah, you know, and just to kind of let you guys know why I had that question, is because I, I agree a lot um, with what you were saying, is that I think it's it's okay Um you know, like Farmer said, as long as that like super OP card in that direction doesn't come out, I think it's okay to keep those mechanics there and that strategy open because it's refreshing to see now and then. I mean, let's be honest, as you know, yeah, like um, Mill Druid, Resident Sleeper, et cetera, et cetera. But it was refreshing to at least hear that people are doing it and they're having success. Uh, and yep. at the same time, it's nice to know that it's not going to become the new norm, right? Not everyone's going to be playing Mill Druid and it's not going to be a must have in tournament settings. Uh, so I think having that option there is good. I don't think, uh, personally, I don't think there's a need to like shut that down as soon as it pops up. Um, no. and hopefully, Definitely. hopefully we won't see that, uh, as we go through here, but, um, as we move on from that, uh, then another question here becomes with, Hearthstone, obviously, uh, something that's uh, kind of un somewhat unique to Hearthstone is the hero powers, right? So you have you have a hero power, which really determines a lot about how you're going to play the game. Uh, even though it's just a very, it seems like a very small part. It's only two mana, and it's just sitting there on your board. But what do you guys think about, you know, how much does the hero power really determine how a hero gets to be played? So, for instance. Uh, that's one of the biggest reasons why Warlock is considered so versatile, right? Because your hero power will somewhat always be useful. Uh, and then, but then we have something like Warrior, who, like, there is literally no other way to use your hero power than to armor up and gain effective health. Well, I think the, it, it does affect uh, the board, like, the, the deck a lot, because, for example, uh, well, Warlock, obviously, uh, I feel that um, hero power is the strongest, and drawing cards makes the, the hero power great for everything. Like, it's fantastic for aggro because just throw all the minions on the board and then you replenish your hand with hero power. It makes it great for combo decks because you just play cards and you draw a lot of cards to try to get combo pieces, and it's great for the control deck because, again, you just uh, draw cards and draw the answers that you need, so... I think that hero power is OP and should be changed. But other than that, I agree. Warrior, you armor up. So if you want to play contra, uh, if you want to play aggro warrior, you feel that your uh, like hero power is a bit useless. Like you will use it when you have two mana. But other than that, you would love to do something else, like play a card. And with hunter again, uh, control hunter, there is a cool new minion uh, introduced, the marksman, so that you can use your mm -hmm. hero power as a as a removal card. So now maybe people can toy with the control hunter. And I haven't tried it myself, but I got feedback that Control Hunter is actually a thing and you can play it uh, and grind on, on the ladder. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. But then 
we need some minion like that introduced for other heroes, like so that armor up actually does does something that the aggro can use it. Maybe a minion that you just you know break the armor and it splatters and uh, or shatters and you, you damage your opponent for one or something <laughs> like that. So I think I think it really influences the deck building and um, it derives from World of Warcraft card game where. You had a hero card and you had something called a flip. So it was like a hero power, but you could you could use it one time, like once a game. And for example, there was the shaman that had a hero power called uh well I don't need remember how it was called, but basically for four oh. mana, you use it once and then you buff all your minions plus two attack. And uh, it means that that did this also influenced the kind of a deck you built around this hero power because you, you build a deck with a lot of minions, you just swarm the board and then you hero power and just push like blood it's like bloodlust right on a, on a uh, on a hero power so um yeah i think it's really important and i hope that in the future we'll get like different hero powers some a different priest with a different hero power different warlock with different hero power <laughs> sorry Nish. our producers have i'm looking at farm as well. stupid farm cameras, cameras. Like, farm is like deal with it going crazy what the deal hell? with it farm, <laughs> we'll deal i love it though i love the new look farm here the sunglasses really go pretty well good, pretty good he just oh, well, won deck wars so he's so like you know deal with it just new webcam is like crazy going crazy day. it's all it's all sometimes sometimes um, our our cameras are not the best but well, yeah if you have anything we're talking about hero powers right um, yeah. <laughs> God damn it, stupid Zoom. Um, yeah, I think uh, hero powers are a big part of how the how the heroes play. That's why I think um, aggro warrior is never going to be viable because mm. um, you got the hero power that's always a part of um, being like the filler if you don't have enough mana to fill out your curve. So mm. fucking goddamn. Um. <laughs> Should stop now. Um, yeah, uh, the the fill out your curve. Another thing was the uh, priest got a card in the GVG expansion called Shadow Bomber. It's a one mana two one that deals three damage to both um, to both heroes. That's a right. card that would that uh, Zoo would run in a heartbeat. Um, priest can't because priest can't build a, a deck around that because your hero power is supposed to heal. You have like a card that changes uh, your hero power uh, shadow form, but that's not viable because it's too much mana. And mm. uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, Druid Hero Power, for instance, is very versatile. I just like you can play it pretty much everything with it. It's like always one damage. Pretty much every other Hero Power is like revolves about one damage. Just the uh, Warlock, Priest, and uh, Warlock, Priest, and uh, Hunter are um, different. They only deal like it's either two health or two damage. So mm. yeah, that's why Hunter is a supreme aggro class because you deal two damage to the to the enemy hero that like I don't, I don't see a control hunter happening uh soon because like again the the hero power is a big part of how, how the game is played um the, there was another card introduced for hunter uh the, the steam little sniper where you can target minions but that like right. it's only working for one turn and then the sniper gets killed and then you're using your hero power to the face again so that's uh, very inconsistent. You can't ever use it if you want to, right? It's like maybe it works for one turn where you just like play that, play your hero power for two mana, and that's your turn, and you kill a minion from the opponent. But you might as well have played the uh, arcane shot and just like keep going for face with the um, with the hero power. So um, hero power is a big part of how a, uh, a deck is played, and every card that that can interact with that hero power in a in a good way, in an efficient way, is really really strong. Alchemist Soul Priest is one of those cards that make priest, it's a really really good priest card. You can change your hero power to damage and deal two damage, but you don't have to revolve your deck around that. Uh, another mm -hmm. card is Quartermaster, which is like really really strong coming out of GVG, especially together with the with the Masterful Battle. So yeah, it's a, de definitely a big part of how you play a class. And what you can do with a class, yeah. Uh, even though um, it just seems a small thing. I should add, you know, I was I was playing Warrior. Uh, this was before GG was in Arena, and I got the Steam Little Sniper off of a Pilot of Shredder, and that does not <laughs> let you armor up your minions. 
Although no. technically, according to card text, it should let you. Like, I was very disappointed. I clicked it. I was like, no. Minions get why can I try to get my minions? <laughs> it's like, but it's actually, pretty interesting health. concept to, to armor up your minions. That's right. So bad. You know, on on card text, that's that's what I should have done because it says your hero power. But obviously, it's a hundred card, and therefore that's that's the way it's written. But you know, I think uh, you brought up a good point, Farmer. Is that things like Akanai, Soul Priest have a lot more. Have a lot more versatility, have a lot more uses, but then Shadow Form. I mean, Shadow Form in some ways is a is in a way step even lower than Steam Little Sniper since it it's a spell, so you don't even get the minion on board. And sure, like if you use it twice, you get three damage, but you know that's very limiting. At the same time, I guess if you were to argue theoretically, is the upside of Shadow Form is that it's permanent, so it, it doesn't go away. But maybe that's not what you want as a Prius, and. Uh, you know, Nimsh, you said, you know, you've heard, and I agree, I've heard of people saying, you know, con Control Hunter is a lot more viable now, it's a lot more consistent, but, you know, I think it's, again, it's the same thing with Shadow Form, is that there's too much of a mana commitment uh, to just making that happen, but then, now again, the flip side is that it's not going to be permanent, it will probably get taken out, and uh, and then we talked about it on Tabletop, how do you... How do you fill out the rest of your deck so that you have a different win condition, but still kind of have that concept of control? You know, I think it gets a little iffy at that point. Yeah, I think like what the Blizzard has to introduce is just uh, introduce different hero powers. Um, probably nerf the Warlock and then just give us the option. Um, they can also toy with it. Like they can. It's it's always tricky if they are going to use exactly what uh, WoW TCG had, but they can mimic it. Like they can do something. So for example introduce a slightly more powerful hero power, but you can use it once a game. So, for example, I'm going to, to build a Hunter deck, and I can decide if I want to play Rexar, which is uh, two damage every like turn for two mana, or do I want to play a different Hunter from the lore, and the hero power will be pay six and do something amazing, like once, once a game. Or maybe like even pay, pay just eight mana and, and do the hero power. And then I know that it's like a different concept, and I build the deck around uh, a, a different hero power and then build a, a different hunter deck. And the same with warrior. It's like, then you can, uh, like the the, in, the influence of the hero power, you can build a different warrior. So like, instead of Garrosh, you take maybe Varian Rin and you have uh, a different deck. And instead of two mana armor up, you have this hero power that you can use once a, once a game. And it will be viable for aggro decks. And then you build a warrior Vi Varian Rin aggro with this different hero power. So... There is a lot of flexibility, a lot of good ideas that uh, Blizzard can use. And, you know, this is just the first year. And, uh, I mean, yeah. we are starting the second year of the game. So we are have we will have a lot of cool stuff in front of us, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely. And uh, what you brought up is a good point. Again, I think we forget that it's been only one year. And at the same time, there's, there's just so many resources that Blizzard can draw from in the Warcraft universe, right? And whether it's more cards, whether it's different card mechanics... Or different heroes, different hero powers. Uh, there's definitely a lot more to be explored than I'm sure you know us or you know nor Blizzard have imagined really the end of that potential of how far we can go. And so that's definitely something to look forward to in the future uh, as we stick with the game. And as we kind of wrap up, talk about meta in general is this is something I think I've brought up pretty much every week because there's no strict answer. Uh, I'd like to hear what all the different guests have to say. Oh, a lot of people are saying it seems like we're going more and more every time there's like some card changes or say Nax, and then now we have a GBG. In the end, like in the beginning, everyone's like, oh, nice, we can bring out this new aggro archetype. Uh, this time we had Mech Mage. Obviously, for Nax, it was the evolution of Hunter into Undertaker. But in the end, especially in the tournament settings, too, it's that it just goes even to, to the opposite end of like slower archetypes it's like control warrior is now just a must for everyone and even on ladder right the ladder portion um of that grind oftentimes you'll go with control warrior because it seems a little bit more stable a hand lock becoming actually much more stronger now it seems for a lot of people in their preference than zoo lock what do you think about that do you think that's a trend that's going to continue or it's just a cycle but maybe it feels like it because these games uh, seem to just have a bigger impact with control warrior and things like that well the the thing is about building different aggro decks um, with the expansion. There's always going to be a different uh, control deck that's going to get built too. If you get an expansion that's going to counter the aggro deck, or you're just going to build a mid range deck that's better in racing the aggro deck, or just controlling the board early, and then um, that's going to counter that again. It's 
it's always going to be a cycle. It's always going to be the tournament format. It's going always going to be about decks that counter decks, and there you have to think about um, decks that are most likely going to get played. And if most of them are going to counter your aggro deck, you're probably not going to bring the uh, the aggro deck. Uh, mm. If yeah, if mo most of the, the decks going to counter your aggro deck, you're not going to bring the aggro deck, right? So because you're not going to get a get a win with it, and you're going to Give your opponent most likely uh, a free win with that deck um, most of the time. So you need to know your matchups for tournaments, right? Um, there's still a lot of success in tournaments with Zoo. Like Zoo is an aggro deck, an aggressive uh, like board control deck in the early turns. And then uh, you, you can like, just change it to push for damage and finish the opponent as, as fast as possible, like taking advantage of the, the, the hero power that prevents... Uh, you from putting in cards that are really weak for card draw, right? So that's still a thing. That's always going to be a thing because that Warlock hero power is so strong. That's always going to be the most consistent aggro deck. And the problem with aggro deck is always you don't, you can't sustain that style for a lot of turns because you're going to run out of cards. Aggro always means you play a lot of cards and try to push for damage, and mm -hmm. that means you're going to need to get a lot of card draw. Like Jeeves is one of those cards that um, was introduced that could be really good with aggro, but you always have to dump your hand for it, and that means if you don't play a deck that dumps your hand, dumps your hand, and mm -hmm. play a lot of uh, small minions, then you're you're not going to get value of it. That that means you're not going to get card draw of it, and and that deck that drops a lot of small minions going to get going to be weak to cards like Armorsmith or Whirlwind or Fireworks or Cruel Taskmaster. That always means um, Warrior is going to have an advantage there, and yeah, that's that's pretty much how it goes. Uh, the card draw that's um, that's weak in aggro decks is always going to prevent them from being really really consistent um, in tournament formats because they're rather easy to counter, easier to counter than mid range decks, easier to counter than hard control decks. So that's that's probably the reason why you see a lot of control in mid range decks in tournament formats. I think it's also based like mainly on the on the meta cycle, as far as I mentioned. So if uh, the meta game is all oh, warrior, you're not going to bring the uh, bring a freeze mage. But yeah. um, it's also based on preference. Like, for example, I don't see when when the new set is released, I don't see uh, Strife Crew building a, a rush deck. Like, he will probably try to build the Druid first, like, to go into the control mode. Uh, Chucky will definitely start trying to build a Hunter, uh, a very aggressive build. So it re it's really, like, preference of the players. And then uh, when something is introduced and is successful, then the community picks up and, and people start playing it, and then we have the cycle. So... Uh, we always have room for innovation, but whatever is popular is mostly uh, well. People like that, like the, the general population that uh, likes fast decks because you want to grind ladder fast, you want to do the dailies fast. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, on the performance level, I feel like whatever is being preferred by the players um, is, is the strong. Uh, it's like the most common to play, but all the archetypes are represented. Like. You can still play control success with success, mid range and and, and aggro. So, it's Hearthstone meta game is pretty good, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Really fun right yeah. Now. All right. Yeah, that's kind of. Um, I'm glad you guys bottom uh, gave me that bottom line because that's where I wanted to go. And, uh, yeah, I, I guess I would agree. I I don't think it's in any dire state or anything. I think it's quite healthy. The cycle does seem to continue. It's just. Um, obviously, for for a lot of fans out there, I think I want to add that note. It's that Hearthstone itself has only really been out for a year, and then GVG has also only been out for a month. So, you know, it's still uh, there's there's been so much talk because there's a lot of content now around Hearthstone, and I think that's great. But just because we have so much content and resources, we shouldn't think that you know we've gone through a full cycle or something like that with GVG, and it's uh, it's time to make some decisions. I think there's a lot more time to be taken with that. And as we wrap talk about the meta there, we'll, we'll stop there for this week. We do want to continue talking about, uh, I guess, kind of the esports side of Hearthstone things and then some hot issues that have been going around uh, in the community and maybe even in the tournament scene. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break, get some water, and then we'll be back to talk about recent esports happenings and then wrap the show with some hot issues. And if we have time, maybe some Q&A. So we'll be right back after this break.
Well, welcome back, everyone, to Turn 2. Trevor here with Nimsh uh, from Cloud9, of course, and Faramir from Team RFU. And we just got done talking quite a bit about just the meta and you know, how Hearthstone seems to be developing. And the good news is we all seem to think that it's doing just fine. So nothing to worry about right there. Now, looking at the esports side of things, it's been two weeks since we've... Um, actually, I think it has been maybe three weeks for Turn 2, actually. It's been a little while, basically, since the end of the year in 2014, coming into 2015. So haven't had much of a chance to cover what's happening in esports, but there have been a couple uh, big things that happened, and we'll go in the order that I kind of listed it here just for uh, simplicity's sake. Uh, first of all, Magic Gamey from Korea goes ahead. Uh, first, you know, before that, the week prior to that, she went up uh, into the finals of... Uh, the legendary series and then week six wins ESL legendary week six, uh, you know, beating Trump and Flybird on the way up and then hyped in the finals. Um, what do you guys think about? Uh, I mean, did you guys watch the games and also just w what do you think about the fact that now we do have a cream player, obviously, also um, a uh, a lady now winning the week six of the legendary series and securing a spot to go to the finals of the ESL legendary series. Well, I'm definitely excited. I, I knew magic Emmy for a while. She was, um, behind uh, Prismata, um, tournaments and, uh, she was mm -hmm. all, always in the scene. And before I actually learned that she's joining temple storm, I was, um, well, we are friends on uh, NA ladder. So I was watching her getting to legend easily and getting like first, uh, spots on like, she was, I don't know if, if first, like she was, Top four, I think, at some point. And then uh, we, we talked and she she told me that she's joining Temple Storm. And I was like, it's about time, actually. So, <laughs> And then she was like really excited for the um, ESL tournament. And she was really focused. She was training a lot. And, and she won. So that was amazing. I haven't been watching the games, but I heard that the final was uh, fantastic with like back and forth and, and getting really close score versus hyped. Um, also, like hyped is a, a fantastic player. So, so winning versus hyped in the final versus your your new, new teammate is definitely a good achievement, and uh, I, I think it's deserved. And I, I'm super um, happy that that she made it. And right now she's like, and a really prominent part of the pro scene. And I will be looking forward to to more games from her and uh, deck ideas and the performance. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, when I heard that that she joined Temple Storm, I like I knew that. Short, shortly before she she was announced, and I was like actually really surprised that she's gotten through a team that's that's uh, so prominent. Sure, she was um she was known like along the 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 pro players and just like the, mm -hmm. the different streams and stuff. I knew her from Prismata, um as well, and but yeah, she was never in any tournament before ESL. Um, she had, doesn't didn't uh, doesn't have any tournament experience. Before that, so I was kind of surprised that they picked her up um, for for Temple Storm because that that's actually a big team. They got a lot of accomplished players like Gara, like uh, hyped as well. But uh, I don't know. Reynad also picked up like the, the the what was the Magic player or something like that who never had played Hearthstone. So uh, I don't really know, know what 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 he needs for someone to get picked up. Um, definitely great for her that that she won the the ESL. Uh, legendary series uh, week week six and qualified for that offline event. I think that's quite a big prize pool for the offline event. And yeah, um, it definitely benefited her that she plays a lot of ladder. Um, as Nimsh said, she's a uh, definitely a great ladder player. And the ESL mm -hmm. format is really really good for for play, uh, players that play ladder because um, it's a best of one for three games. And then um, you have like if you still need. Uh, you win, then it's going to into two best of ones again. So that that really benefits a player that plays a lot of ladder and plays a lot of decks that all, only need to win like best of one. So I'm I'm really uh, interested on how she performs in a in a conventional tournament format. Um, I, I'm really interested uh, to see that. And yeah, um, good luck to her. And uh, I'm glad she found a team. And yeah, that's how, how that's that true. Goes. What you mentioned. Well, you mentioned about her success being the legendary series. It, you know, perhaps um, it is that tournament format that fits her a little bit better, right? Because she is a she's an avid ladder player. Now, uh, for me personally, I was also just excited to see a Korean um, player, you know, going to the finals and then winning that. Uh, just because Hearthstone in Korea has been 
it's still it's still pretty small, right? And now with GVG, and now finally with Android tablets being available, I think we got to give it some time to really see where it grows. But in the past year, it's been very small. I mean, when we saw Cranish uh, go up to the you know the World Championship at BlizzCon, I mean, people had no idea who he was. I mean, we in Korea didn't know who he was until he joined our tournaments at OGN, and we were like. Oh, okay. Well, so you're a student. Great. I mean, like that's all we know about you. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the scene, and that's kind of the scene in Hearthstone in Korea. So uh, I was just also just as happy to see that someone you know who's been playing uh, on NA for a while now has been a very just uh, you know avid player has been getting legend quite frequently, and now has a tournament result under her belt, and now on Tempo Storm. So. Uh, personally, I'm hoping that maybe this will also help boost the Korean scene a little bit more. Uh, but as we all mentioned, right, so she joins Tempo Storm. And now, uh, personally, I do want to focus a little more on the fact that, you know, what do you guys think about uh, Korea entering the scene a little bit more? Do you guys want to see more of that? What do you think maybe is necessary if you've spoken to some Korean players uh, in the past? Uh, and then uh, also, I do, I don't want to focus on it too much, but I do want to touch on the fact that you know, Hearthstone is a very different esport. And do you think, um, and this will be a broader discussion, but uh, women as professional players in esports, right? For instance, in team games, oftentimes the biggest issue is you live in a team house. And there's just a, a lot of other logistics that go into that if you're going to have both genders on the same team. Uh, but for Hearthstone, uh, that's not the case. So do you think maybe this is another avenue where we, uh, Hearthstone just kind of lends itself to being more open uh, to who can just join in at any time? Well, it's not the case, uh, not not yet, let's say, because we are starting to get team houses. And um, right now right. we have the, the Arkham team house and we have uh, the Root team house where in the in Root team house, there's six on Skaka and Arkham is like far but hosty and now uh, admirable. And I think KitKat is also moving. So even though it's uh, Arkham, there will be a couple of players. And uh, from experience, I'd say, uh, well, experience, <laughs> there are poker houses. Like it's good to have... Um, people interested in the same hobby and trying to excel at the hobby at one place where you can share experiences, discuss strategies and play the game together and where a couple of players are watching you and uh, you know, you're grinding louder and a couple of players are just watching and you're talking about it. So it really uh, changes the perspective and you can get better at the game. So I feel like the team houses for Hearthstone are the, the thing and they will pop out um, this year probably. And uh, I'm not sure, like, I heard that there are some playhouses in, um, I think in China, actually. I'm not sure about it, but uh, it's like not team houses, but playhouses. Maybe in Korea as well. Like people just, you know, living together, gathering up and, and playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, not being sponsored by just, you know, trying to discuss the, the strategy, strategy. So to ask you, uh, to answer your original question, I'm definitely excited to see Korea getting more involved, uh, especially seeing Korea really excelling at, uh, at esports. At, uh, at StarCraft specifically, um, and, and people being really dedicated and, and you know, just uh, spending their lives on a game, trying to, to, to reach the final uh, re reaches of the, of the game. And just uh, because I feel like in e Europe and, uh, and US, people lack focus. They like, they play the game, they enjoy the game, they try to be the best, but then they like other stuff as well. Uh, and they just spend time on, on reading comic books and, you know, playing other games and trying to spend stuff on other things. And uh, it, it's just, it, it's a distraction. And I feel like in uh, the players, the pro players in Korea, they just really focus on the game and they can bring the the, the pro level to another level, another level. And um, I'm, I will be definitely looking forward to that. Well, um, if I can address the the female mm -hmm. uh, gamer issue first, um, I I really don't care if you're like a female or <laughs> a male playing Hearthstone. Right. If you if you're good at the game, then you should be playing that game as much as you want. You should participate in tournaments, do well in tournaments. I know like one other female player who's playing professionally or trying to play professionally, but it's it's definitely not that many playing yet, and it would be great to see diversity. Um, of course. Um, the thing with team houses is like, I don't know, if you if you live in a, like if you want to do that professionally as a female gamer, then you might have to deal with that if there's gonna be team houses, because like you can't always make like a pure female team or just like a pure ma male team. So like there are other, <laughs> like, I feel like there are millions of like just people living together like 
male and female all over the world just like live together normally it's just like so there should be possible in a gaming house as mm -hmm. well so i don't see how that should be the problem um yeah, the other thing in uh, korea like if korea would join in esports uh in hearthstone that would be amazing because like korea is like considered the the home of esports pretty much because like they started really really big with it with starcraft i believe that was like the first esports that got really pushed and yeah that's that's like if i'm not mistaken that's like on, on national tv there as well and like you have like channels that that only stream like esports and I, but i also believe like League of legends took like a while to get picked up by the uh, by the korean scene right it was like season one was like a lot of european teams dominating so mm -hmm. um there should be, definitely be time be time for for korea to pick that back up like also, uh, Rainy Hour just joined uh, SK Gaming, was like another right. Korean player. Um, so they're going to join Western teams for now because um, they're the established teams in Hearthstone. But if they're going to be Korean teams, they're going to dedicate their time to Hearthstone. If there's going to be enough money in Hearthstone to um, get a career in that, like players in Korea are going to pick up their they're dedicated more than other any other uh, con like continent that plays esports because they they know what they have to do and they they put in the time and they put in the effort and Hearthstone is a little different because you don't it's not mechanic based so it's not yeah um, you don't need to you don't need to like practice 10 hours a day and you automatically get better at mechanics it's it's more uh, like the mindset you have to have and the the matchups you have to know stuff like that um experience as well that makes you good at the game so uh, the practice times are not that much what it takes in Hearthstone, but it helps. And yeah, if, if there would be more Korean organizations, more Korean um, uh, players joining the game, bringing it to another level, because like Europeans would be um, would be pushed by that as well. So that could only help if there is more competition, more more different decks um, brought in. Like you see now, like China has a kind of different. They're still playing a lot of the same classes are popular, but they're innovating a lot of different things. It's it's hard in Hearthstone because there's not that many things they can innovate because it's only thirty cards. And but yeah, if you would get Korean events, we could get events all over the world. Um, I think there's like a Korean event in like two months, if I'm not mistaken, uh, like a Hearthstone event. So that that's gonna end up uh, being more popular over there. Like could definitely give the Hearthstone mm. esports uh, scene in particular a really, really big boost, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, you know, I think you brought up a good point in that um, the mechanics, right? It's not a lot of muscle memory in Hearthstone or something like that, and uh, and so you know, putting what you guys put together, and as someone who's watched you know Korean esports and you know lived here with the culture and have talked to the players, that is a big question, and the Koreans are now wondering that themselves. They're like, well. Now that us practicing for like 10 hours a day, the muscle memory aspect doesn't really benefit us anymore in Hearthstone. You know, maybe actually we're, we're not, we're, we just have to accept we're not the best. Uh, we're, and we're actually far from, we have a far road to even be the best uh, in Hearthstone just because innovation was actually never Korea's strong point in any title. Um, taking an innovative idea and then perfecting it might have been. But again, that comes with the hours and something like that. And so in a card game where sometimes, like you said, Nimsh, the element of surprise might be your strongest weapon uh, at certain tournaments. That's not going to be Korea's strong point for now. And uh, I'm glad we touched upon that because uh, having talked to the Korean casters, uh, especially, they're like, you know, I really respect uh, Kalento. I really respect Strife Crow. You know, even if they don't have, even if they didn't win this tournament, uh, they're the ones that made this deck. They're the ones that everyone knows. And so hopefully... Hopefully we'll start to see that change. And like you guys mentioned, um, Farmer, like you mentioned, if there's a little bit more attention uh, in the public sector to Hearthstone, teams will now, the established teams in Korea, will now set kind of resources up so that players are inclined to join them rather than just working remotely with a Western team. Well, you're saying that with the creative uh, and Korea being more like focusing on, on just practicing, but then I imagine Kranich versus Colento or... Kranich is playing True. This just crazy de <laughs> warrior deck that it's really hard to plan against and uh, encounter that there is exactly 16 points of lethal and uh, you know it's 
as a nation, uh, I probably agree. And uh, but you always have those individuals, and um, yes, and it's like one player that's. Uh, it really happens like there's like one guy who is really creative and he has this idea and he gets this deck and he gets this deck, uh, he prepares this deck for the tournament and he just storms the tournament with it and he becomes the, the world champion or he becomes the the national champion. So uh, it's not like, you know, everybody needs to be creative. It's uh, also like when, the, when it comes to the team structure, uh, you want to have a couple of creative guys, you want to have a couple of deck builders, but you also want to have grinders, like people who will just take those mm -hmm. creative ideas and they will just play thousands of games and fine tune them. And you want to have players who are just good at refining decks, like even not even grinding, but just, you know, looking at the decks and maybe you can like change those three or four cards or, or just adjust them. So you don't need to be that creative to be successful, but definitely it helps. And um, you can steal a couple of tournaments if you're really creative. That's a good point you bring up where uh hearthstone so obviously in other games i guess you could relate it to having a robust robust uh, coaching staff right different coaches focus on different aspects whether it's uh the just like emotional health of players and then you look at mechanics and then you look at replays like especially in korea some some teams have like three four five coaches but in hearthstone these can all just be players themselves but then at that point uh this is a logistical question what do you think is the best way to manage that logistically right for instance uh, let's go with the obvious, like pay, right? So obviously the players who end up, who are the ones who are grinding and then actually really take embody that deck are going to be the ones who end up really performing at the tournaments just because they spent the most time with it and they'll have their prize winnings. But how do you, how do you make this worth it for everyone that's involved? I think it's a very tough question because I know that uh, in established esports, you have those levels of people who are, um, like testing partners, for example, and you, you, you those guys are just, uh, I think it's StarCraft, somebody explained it to me. So you have people who are just testing partners and they are getting paid as testing partners. And then do you have you know, right. those pro players who are competing in those in the tournaments and they are paid more because they are the the, uh, the pro players. But those those test partners can get better and then can, they can become the pro players and then can, can they can get the pay. In Hearthstone, it's really difficult to have the structure like, like this because... Most of the people they uh, they practice and and the tournaments tournament results are not it, it, they are hard to be measured because sometimes you have people who have very consistent tournament results but they are never first like they are always in top eight but they are never first and then you have mm -hmm. uh, some guys who just uh, win or fail like uh, they win tournament and then they get eliminated they get eliminated again and then they win another tournament and nothing. <laughs> changes that much like for for their practice schedules and stuff so um I'm, I'm talking mostly from experience from the last year and a couple of years um in card games like sometimes you have those guys who just have different play style play styles and they succeed so um a good example will be uh at an rdu for example right rdu had a very successful run he won uh, like an insane amount of tournaments and then it stopped and did he change anything no he was still practicing a lot and he was trying to win the tournaments it's just Sometimes it, it happens. So I think for now, we just have to uh, apply this team structure and um, the payment structure that is um, like more or less equal and just uh, try to, to find those the gem players, like the players who are mm -hmm. just the best and excel and everything. They're dedicated and talented and, and maybe reward them for, for the results. But then again, it's really hard to, to make us, uh, you know, a distinction. All right. Um, anything you want you want to add, Farmir? Or well, uh, in case of like the payments or stuff, I don't really know how it how it is in other esports and what what gets paid there. How people behind the scenes get paid and stuff like. But like, there's still a lot of room to for development for sure. And like to figure, I still I still think we got like still time to figure mm -hmm. that stuff out as well, because like. Like as we said, like a lot of times at that show already, like it's it's only like one year old, with the and <laughs> Hearthstone already has tournaments that are really really well, like they're great prize pools at tournaments like DreamHack and stuff. That's they're they're so they they're already pretty far and what what the tournament structure goes. So there's still like the room for development for uh, team structures, and I'm sure 
smarter minds than me are gonna figure something out for payments and team houses like our country started theirs and um it's probably like all sponsored by by the owner from Archon, right? By a mass, but there's there's probably like other teams that are gonna do that as well, and yeah, we'll see we'll see how that goes. So what's gonna get figured out, and like let's hope that the players don't have to <laughs> worry about that too much because uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not really the the one that to figure that stuff out. Yeah, uh, of course. Hopefully, uh, as we see, and you know, more teams coming through, and you know, Archon's a good example of um, you know just a team built kind of grassroots, right? Our, our Amaz said, I'm, I want to build this team. So starting that up, and then we obviously have established uh, organizations uh, like you guys have, you know, Cloud9, RFU, uh, we have Team Liquid, um, and players from there. And I think I think it will develop, so we'll see, we'll see how it pans out. Now on the side of esports, um, also uh, to wrap up 2014, we had the Better. Pinnacle Tournament from actually, of course, Amaz, and Archon there. Now, let's let's go with the result first, right? Firebat wins in the end. Um, you know, the world champion from BlizzCon wins another tournament. And I didn't, I didn't actually didn't get to catch most of the games of Pinnacle. Um, but what did you guys think of the play there, uh, the plays in general? It doesn't have to be just Firebat, but anything that really stood out to you guys in terms of plays or decks? I liked uh, the coup format, which was the ban format, but you ban the, the deck... Um in between matches so like we normally you assign the ban before the match starts so like mm -hmm. i say i ban warlock and you ban warlock so we don't play warlock at all but here it's like we start and i for example start mage you start, you start warlock and i'm like all right i will ban your warlock and then i'll take my druid and you take your let's say mage and you decide if you want to ban or not if you want to play out the game so that was that was cool and it was uh, funny when I was watching Tides of Time because Tides, Tides was playing versus... Um, I don't remember who. I think Sixo. And Sixo was able to win 3-0 uh, versus Tides of Time with a Paladin. Yeah. Because Tides didn't want to ban Paladin. like He probably wanted to ban Warlock. So he thought, I can defeat this Paladin. I can do something against it. And then Sixo just went 3-0 uh, with Paladin. And uh, Ties of Time is facing RDU, and RDU is it, taking his Paladin, and he insta bans Paladin this time. Yeah. So the funny part like, was he, he ended up facing Zixo again, and then he yeah. banned something else, and then he, they got 3 out by Warlock, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, the oh. Zixo came through. That's how it goes through. sometimes, I guess, and he was pretty salty after that. Oh, well. Meant, I also watched the final. Zixo versus Firebat. That was a pretty exciting final. Mm -hmm. A back and forth, and... Uh, Again, Firebat bringing something new, and um, both Firebat and Sixo, I think uh, they are similar in playstyles because they put like an insane volume um, of games. Like uh, Firebat, I, I know James for uh, for some time already. So um, like we we were practicing for the World Championships, the the qualifiers, and then we talked a bit. Uh, and I met him recently um, again because I met him at BlizzCon, obviously. But then I met him at, in France, and uh, Firebat was playing Harson all the time. Um, in France, uh, it didn't work for him. He he was eliminated from the tournament uh, pretty early, but still, he was just sitting there and playing Hearthstone all the time. Louder, playing versus Tides of Time, like just queuing, just queuing, just queuing. And uh, Sixo is the same. Like Sixo plays Hearthstone also all the time, and those those guys are focused. So, not surprised to see them in the final. Firebat versus Sixo. It's like US uh, biggest grinder versus uh, European versus grinder. Well, Sixo is actually both <laughs> European and US at this at this, at this yeah. time. <laughs> spending time in the US right now. And um yeah. so so that that's cool and a pretty cool match as well. Uh some some new ideas and uh yeah, definitely like a pinnacle of Hearthstone, a good tournament, a production value was pretty good as well. So I, I definitely enjoyed. Well, if I can talk about the pinnacle for a second as well. Um uh D two or like a teammate of me had to play in that as well. And they had a bunch of DDoS problems. Um Right at the at like one day or two days, I, I, I believe, and yeah, like I feel like Savit's games were severely like damaged by that. He like always had to replay a game and just like give the win here and and yeah, they had a bunch of problems actually, and they had to reschedule tournaments for another day. And mm -hmm. they casted it live, but it was pre-recorded, so the turn like the finals actually not not live and the, the semi-finals, so. Um, D2 ended up, like he's just in Japan, so he has a different schedule than the NA people, so he had to 
end up playing like 11 hours when you always up like 20 hours so it was kind of poorly handled but like sometimes things like that can happen in online tournaments right um but it's really unfortunate and like it shouldn't sh shouldn't happen i guess like other but like <laughs> i guess you see it in other stuff as well where you just like when you the internet dies and like season two world championships from from the legends just like <laughs> the whole yeah. venue just internet like stuff like that can happen in like an online game but it really shouldn't and like that that, that was kind of like the the weak point from pinnacle like like so, something like that like i won i won two tournaments uh like right for the week before pinnacle as well like tavern takeover and here's the cards and Sick that it didn't rock. have that much ex exposure yeah thanks man but like <laughs> one of those had like sound issues as well so they didn't get as much viewers as they used to so that's like mm -hmm. um if you can eliminate those those factors those like ddos and like sound issues whatever and uh, that that make that make make it unattractive to people who are watching then i think you can get a lot of more exposure for those small tournaments those online tournaments as well like well, pinnacle had like a lot of exposure because it was another tournament from Amaz, right? And he brings a lot of following into the tournament scene uh, anywhere. I think it's also always a question, like, do you want to watch the live tournament or, or can you watch pre-recorded? Because right. I, like, myself, I'm fine with pre-recorded stuff casted live. Um, we did this for VGVN and uh, I, I was casting the tournament, but I, I, we had a lot of viewers and people were uh, really happy about the quality and everything. And uh, also as casters, Everything was super smooth because the players, they did play their games during the week. Then everything was recorded and we were just running a, like eight hour video and casting from that. So the breaks were pretty short and we knew that there are no production issues possible, no DDoS because everything is played. And it was it was fun to cast and, and fun to watch. But uh, people, they do love the, the live um, events and in, at live events, they have to accept it. If you are watching like a purely live event, those things can happen. Like it's, it's like some players can just lose internet, or the, the something can happen with the with the file or whatever. So, you know, Twitch can come ca come down. I guess it's, it affects both kinds of of tournaments. But still, like issues yeah. will happen. Hopefully, um, only a few or, or none. But um, you have to accept it. Yeah, and so by all means, even LAN events, right? You, you're gonna you kind of have to expect technical issues. Not that they have to happen, but basically um, something that I've been told even when I used to do music is you can't ever go into a performance or an event saying that you're going to do your 100%. You have to assume that you're you're actually only going to be able to do 99 no matter how hard you try. So then after that first hiccup happens, whether it's a power outage, right, at BlizzCon, or whether, um, whether it's, you know, you mess up a play as a player, you have to then say, okay, that was my one mistake for this event and then move on. And so from a production standpoint, that's a good attitude to have. But uh, when it comes to online tournaments, right, uh, specifically let's talk about DDoS because now it's become a very highlighted issue in the Hearthstone community. This is a issue that other titles and you know have dealt with a lot in online tournaments. And so the question really becomes, should you know we as a Hearthstone community have been a little bit more aware of all these steps and obstacles and hurdles that other titles have kind of gone through for us in terms of how to set up online tournaments and how to make it smoother so that we can minimize that? Or do you think because titles are different, obviously some things, uh, for instance, the early stages of Hearthstone, there was no observer spectator mode. So it was up to the Hearthstone community to figure something out for that. Um, do you think these are te the technical aspects are also a part of that where every time a new title comes up, uh, it's kind of on that community to learn you know, with their own hands and feet? <laughs> yeah, I definitely think we have to go through the learning process. Like uh, the high mom from DreamHack was one example that everybody was like surprised mm -hmm. that it can happen. And we had mm -hmm. a couple of, of dramas this year as well. We had a couple of problems. But um, the, the tournament organizers were figuring it out like more or less. And also Blizzard was really helpful with the stuff. Like for example, for the EU qualifier for BlizzCon, uh, the software just went down and the same issue happened. And... Um, gamers origin in, in Paris but it's like we have to go through those things like uh, some software needs to be developed or or we we need to find a good software that you can run a tournament for like 500 people 
and uh, we need to get through like uh, the safety pr procedures to avoid DDoS. And uh, I'm sure we will face like some more problems when we encounter them. It's really hard to to think about possible issues uh, right now. Also, like Harson can have those specific Harson issues that can uh, occur. And uh, mm -hmm. I think like community and or organizers were pretty swift with reacting to to those issues. But uh, I would definitely expect some this year as well. Well, it's not gonna be yeah. perfect from the start, right? Um, I guess we can learn some things from other from other uh, esports, but pretty much always gonna be like a, a an online game, right? Like, can like kind of compare it to like winter sports, right? It's like always gonna be an outside outside sport, <laughs> and there's always gonna be like wind issues or whatever. It's like too much snow, like you can't do anything about it, right? You have to deal with it, and you have to adapt and do your best to prevent that the next time. But if you can't do anything about it, then yeah, there's not much you can do sometimes. And you, know, you have to deal with it the best you can. Go through that learning process. Eliminate as m many threats as possible. And yeah, bring viewers, viewers the best content that you can produce. I think like I can do a premonition. So in 2015, we are going to have a drama with the cheaters. Somebody <laughs> will write a software <laughs> To be able to grind ladder, <laughs> like we we had the bots, right? But we'll have right. something better. Somebody will write it. Somebody will abuse tournaments with it, and then somebody will find out. And we'll have like we, we had the, the drama in Counter Strike. We'll have it in Hearthstone. We'll be yeah. chasing ghosts and soft <laughs> play one Ragnaros and deal sixteen damage. <laughs> Crit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, obviously not Crit something. Ragnaros. <laughs> <laughs> not something we're. Not something we're uh, looking forward to or happy per se, but um, you know, I think you make a good point, Nimsha. You know, you you say it half jokingly, but I think that's the way to look at it. Is that these things are bound to happen, and like you said, Farmir, no matter even no matter how much you learn from other titles and what they went through and the history of esports, in the end, the internet is the internet, right? Tech technology is technology. There will be hiccups, and you just kind of have to learn uh, on your own in your own ways, how to kind of minimize that for your title and for your event. Obviously, for tournament organizers, organizers, excuse me, it's very different because maybe you only do lands, so then you only have to focus on a different aspect of that. But then for online tournaments, it's a whole different game. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good point. And like you said, Nimsh, we, I, we surely will have drama uh, in this year, 2015, and it will be for the better in the long run, right? It will fix it for the better in the long run. So... Um, I'm sure we'll brave the storm and we'll come out just fine. And as you know, as we kind of wrap things up here for turn two, since it is 2015, it's the first episode of turn two here in the new year. Um, kind of what are what are your New Year's resolutions for Hearthstone for yourselves? And also, what's what do you want to kind of see? Whether it's in the game itself, uh, let's say like a game mechanic, or in an expansion, or maybe from the community or tournaments, anything. Like I like I know Nim's already able to live from from his from his passion, right? Like we <laughs> talked like way back in then was it like Take the Invitational about him like playing that professionally and like I just started out there. And yeah, that's definitely like one goal for me to uh be able to live from it, make enough money to sustain myself. Might like there's gonna be a lot of gaming houses this year probably upcoming so that, that might be like a cool thing so yeah other than that like a mechanic that could be introduced like a lot of people are asking for graveyard that's like a mechanic that's that's key in a lot of different um in a lot of different uh, card games, card games yeah. um but yeah in Hearthstone, i can i can't see it right now but like if, if you do that you have to do it right or you're going to destroy the game and that's like one thing that you really have to figure out the right way, because it's gonna, it's gonna affect all the cards that were already there before, like that particular expansion comes out. So you have to really take care of like every card and like adjust it to the matter that it could be made and stuff like that. So yeah, that's really an interesting mechanic to to implement. Another thing Nimsh talked about earlier, the the thing with the different hero powers, maybe different heroes for for one class. That's uh, maybe something you could implement to really make use of cards that aren't used that much in a in a class like Hunter, just because they're not fitting into the the aggro style of the hero player, right? 
there's so many cards that that are decent but aren't good with the hero power that, that the different classes have and they're just not getting played because they don't synergize with the with the deck that's best for the class so that's definitely like one thing that that you could do going forward so yeah we got a lot, lot of things uh, ahead of us in 2015 so I'm gonna look forward to that see what comes up for me pers for me personally um definitely world championships they have this this touch of of greatness so my dream was always to become a world champion at something and uh, <laughs> right now i'm focusing on hearthstone i i was there at the world championships final on the on the casting desk so my dream is to become the player who is actually playing there but uh it's a long way and i will definitely be focusing on uh, honing my skills and then just uh, becoming better, better, and better to be able to to qualify and to play at the World Champs at BlizzCon as a player. And uh, another thing, like what I'm looking forward to in Hearthstone, are the um, in-game tournaments. Uh, I think that would be amazing to have, like, to be able to queue not the ladder, but just to queue um, a tournament where you play best of threes or like best of ones versus people in advance. Like, uh, even if, if without money, just uh, whatever incentive they that there can be just uh, so that people can sign up and you have like 500 people tournament or just go best of ones and and then you have the ranking that ranks the people who play tournaments i feel like this would uh kind of make a split between the the competitive uh high competitive people and the people who grind ladder because there will be like tournament players there will be like ladder grinders and arena players so i'm definitely looking forward to that if there is a buy-in and it, you actually can get like small small prizes um that would be amazing but i don't think it, it's yeah. happening anytime soon <laughs> yeah that's <clears throat> that's definitely a, a topic that's come up and i think something that a lot of people are passionate about i know for one i'd be very excited about that um i guess just to wrap things up i'll take my turn uh for me i guess the new year's resolution for hearthstone would be um you know i, I really want to I think uh, I had this discussion with Artosis actually last year where uh, we were talking and we just said, well, you know, there's there's a lot of us who were casters in other titles uh, that are now casting Hearthstone. And then there's a lot of like a very passionate card players who haven't casted before, but they obviously know the history of card games a little bit better. And despite all of that, we still don't think that there's been a f like the golden balance found in, you know, what maybe kind of is the best way to cast Hearthstone. Obviously, uh, the benefit of Hearthstone is that I think that range is broader than in other titles. It doesn't have to be strict. Uh, so, you know, as a caster myself, I kind of want to just do, you know, do more content delivery to at least contribute to that research so that we can all um, decide, oh, maybe, you know, at least for these people, this is the best way in these. I, I think there's not even that kind of norm right now. It's just depending on the person to person. So I'd love to see that develop uh, in terms of content delivery for Hearthstone. And then in terms of features, I mean, I mean, the list could go on and on, right? Uh, personally, I just because I love I love kind of wacky experimenting, I, I would just like, no matter what it is, a very just fresh card mechanic, uh, maybe in, in an expansion coming through in 2015 that, you know, that like doesn't just expand overload? on Death Brothers or something like that. Mega, mega overload. I mean, even that right would be fresh enough for me. So I have a good um, mechanic for you. Uh, oh leveling up cards. So cards that change depending on which turn you draw them. So for example, a sapling. You draw it in your opening hand. It's a oh, one-one right. sapling. You draw it on turn five. It's a free-free root or something. And then you draw <laughs> it on turn ten, and it's a twelve-twelve Groot, or you know, like it's whatever tree of big life. That's stuff like that. That's interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, there are, and this is something that people have talked about is that there are things that only Hearthstone, um, well, not just only Hearthstone, but Hearthstone can do because it's digital, right, compared to uh, just a physical card game. So maybe something that takes that into account would be pretty neat. Um, but yeah, so I think all in all, 2015 is looking to be a great second year of Hearthstone, and I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we as a community were so young, and yet here we are, like discussing meta, discussing esports, and we've had the world championship. And so, 2015 is definitely going to be an exciting year. Uh, as we wrap things up, uh, if you guys want to give quick shout outs, uh, especially for Farmier, I know you didn't get a chance uh, during the winner's interview because we had to move on with Tabletop. But as the winner of also <laughs> week four of Death Wars, we'll start with you. Shout outs uh, to fans, sponsors, etc. 
Uh, yeah, shout out to our sponsors, definitely King One and Waypoint. And yeah, check out IHU, uh, the website from my team. It's pretty awesome. It's like where we're doing this show here too, right? It's also from IHU. And yeah, there's going to be a lot of video content from the players. Um, upcoming, a lot of uh, shows as well. Maybe like another King of the Hill series. We'll see. Uh, that's coming up. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, shout out to Toast because she's awesome. And yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Awesome. Uh, what about you, Nimsh? All right. So as always, shout out to my team, Cloud9, and all the team members. Shout out to our sponsors. And um, shout out to you for having us here uh, as a host. That's uh, <laughs> that's different being a guest. So it was a very cool experience. And if you guys uh, if you guys want, you can follow me on, on Twitch and, um, and Twitter. I started streaming in December. Like I wasn't streaming last year that much, but uh, in December I started. So now I stream every day, almost from Monday to Friday, starting 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Uh, CEST time. It's kind of late for US. It's like, I think 1 a.m. in the night for EST, I believe, or PST. I'm not sure. Basically, it's on my channel, which is Twitch slash Nimsh. Oh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah! If I, if we can cut in again, like I'm gonna start oh, yeah. streaming. I'm gonna start streaming. <laughs> Always forget that. I'm gonna start streaming next week. Uh, I got my my computer set up. Yeah, uh, gonna get my internet soon, so it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna stream a lot actually. Uh, every, like all the time when I got got time, nothing else to do. I'm gonna stream Hearthstone. So check it out. Gonna be at Fire Me HS. And yeah, check me out at at Twitter. I have you. Or IHU underscore Fermier and Facebook as well now. So Fermier HS. So yeah, check it out if you want to keep up to date and see what I what I'm doing all day. Thanks. Very nice. Um, yeah, and so all of our social media stuff for you guys watching, uh, it's right under a camera, so you can go uh, find us uh, on social media on Twitch. I think all three of us stream uh, to varying degrees, and uh, I stream mainly actually a Hearthstone these days too. And so you can check that out uh, for me. I mean, of course, shout out to uh, Machinima for uh, hosting us here. And then, of course, iHeartU uh, as this show you know, continues on, uh, powered by Kinguin. And for the viewers, uh, you can find the VODs and, you know, whether it's the MP3 or iTunes uh, audios of these shows, including Deck Wars, all on iHeartU.com. So you can just go there uh, if you maybe miss some part or you want to tell your friends to catch up on what happened this week on our shows. That uh, they, will, they will all be compiled on iHeartU.com. So check that out. This was Chobra with Nimsh and Farmir for Turn 2, Episode 41, the first one of 2015. We'll be back next week with more Deck Wars, more Tabletop, and more Turn 2. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.